next in a new series of Crime Watch UK. Well, good evening and welcome to this, the ninth year of Crime Watch UK. Over the summer break we've had the builders in and we've moved the furniture about a bit as you can see, but the purpose of the programme remains the same as it ever has, to solve serious crimes with your help. We're live and if you see anything you recognise tonight, the telephone number to ring direct to the detectives and the researchers here is as always 081 811 8181. And for the hard of hearing there's the Minicom number there on your screen just underneath it. First, a notorious crime that two months ago made headlines all over Britain. On Wimbledon Common in southwest London, a young mother, Rachel Nickell, was waylaid and repeatedly stabbed. Her scratched and bruised two-year-old son was found clinging to her body. It appears to be a random killing, which of course makes it extremely hard to solve. So tonight, detectives are putting all their cards on the table and they're appealing for the whole nation's help to name the killer. The appeal is in two parts. First, for crucial witnesses, some of whom have yet to be traced. Second, an appeal to the killer's mother or friends or family. In the next few minutes, Superintendent John Bassett is going to reveal everything that's known about the murderer, including a, a great deal that's never been reve revealed before. Someone watching must be able to piece the clues together. This is an area known as the Mound. Behind it is the main A3. And south of the mound is where Rachel walked that morning with her son and the dog romping off ahead of her. Just in front of her is a path that leads to a bridle way. This is her path seen from the air, and this, marked with an X, is where she met her killer. First, the hunt for the remaining witnesses, most of whom have come forward, people on the common. Yes. You still think there are others? Oh, yes. I, I think there are a number of witnesses who have yet to come forward. In fact, as late as Friday, a very important witness was seen by us, so there are more to come forward. And not just on the common, but I know in the cemetery to the, to the west of it, and also north of the A3, towards Putney and Roehampton. Yes, that's right. Uh, there was a witness seen north of the A3, uh, running towards the Roehampton estate. Uh, he was a man dressed just in blue boxer shorts that morning, and had a bundle of clothing under his arm. We don't think he's involved, but we'd like to eliminate him from the inquiry. Okay, so if that was you, that may not be a very flattering picture of you, but please do call us straight away. Okay, now to uh, identify the killer. Remember the date, Wednesday the 15th of July. This is what we know so far. A mother and her two teenage sons saw a man here by the curling pond. Now that was about quarter past ten. It's about 15 minutes before Rachel was murdered. It's five minutes walk from here to the murder scene. Murder scene again marked with a cross. The man was in his 20s or 30s. He was tall, more than 5 feet 10, and had short brown hair. He had a white shirt with buttons and dark trousers, possibly blue, and was carrying a small dark bag. Curiously, his belt was over his shirt rather than round his trousers. Or perhaps it was a dog lead. He seemed to bend forward slightly as he walked. Was he trying to hide his face? The family who saw him were suspicious because they had the impression he was following a woman. Now, that woman was the one who was traced on Friday. She thought the man was probably on his way to work, but a few minutes later, about 20 past 10, he reappeared back by the pond. No one saw him go down south on the open ground towards the mound, but if he took this path, it would lead him through the trees towards Rachel Nickell. Now, if that was you and you didn't head down here and didn't encounter Rachel, you're nonetheless a key witness. Now is the time to call 081 811 8181. Then perhaps three minutes after the murder, a man was seen here. He too looked suspicious because he turned his face from the witness as though he didn't want to be seen. And he seemed to crouch down as though he was trying to wash himself. Indeed, there is a small stream here. Rachel's killer would certainly have her blood on him. This man too was in his late twenties or early thirties. He was tall, maybe six feet, and he too had short brown hair. He wore a light top and loose-fitting jeans or trousers. Again, he was carrying a dark bag. 
Again, if it was you and you had nothing to do with the murder, call us now, 081 811 Now, from this point, let's add some informed conjecture. A consultant clinical psychologist has been handed evidence of Rachel's murder, and he's been comparing its hallmarks with other psychopathic killings. He's drawing up a likely profile of the killer, and though it won't be completed until next week, his official guidance is already as follows. The killer is under the age of 30. He lives locally. He still lives at home with his mum or parents, or alone in a hostel or a bedsit. He's untidy and disorganised. It's possible he has a bike, but he probably doesn't drive a car. He's a low achiever, so he's never done well at exams. He's not very good at conversation. He has few friends and has solitary hobbies. He may have an interest in martial arts. He likes pornography, including some of the violent sort. He doesn't have a steady girlfriend. If he's had previous girlfriends, they'll have found him unsatisfying, sexually inexperienced, and wanting to act out domineering gameplay. He's pestered women before. Indeed, he may have been caught for minor sex offences. He may well have an unskilled job, though if he does, remember, he certainly had that Wednesday morning off back in mid-July. His family will know that something's wrong with him, but they'll obviously find it hard to admit, even to themselves. They'll have noticed his mood changed after mid-July. He was upset or excitable for a few days after that. Above all, he could cause a tragedy and suffering like this again. Now, remember, some of these guidelines could be wrong, but if you can put several clues together and they fit someone you know, we all know the importance of this. Please do call us. John Bass, it's, it's going to be so difficult for a family, whatever their suspicions, to ring. I mean, to, to imagine that someone close to them, or a girlfriend, someone that close to them at some stage could have done this. Yes, it's going to be very, very difficult. Uh, but I would appeal to the females of the Wimbledon area uh, to come forward and identify this man. He is a local man, and I believe a mother, sister, or girlfriend knows the identity of this man. Um, women have an instinct for, for men that are odd like this. This man is dangerous, and he's ill, and he needs attention. I know most unusually in this case for witness, just for this program, you have sought from the Crown Prosecution Service and achieved a guarantee of immunity from yes. anybody who's involved in minor offences. Yes, right. What about confidentiality, promising that families won't, won't be involved? Well, in I, I can promise uh, any family that rings me that their identity will never be revealed, uh, and they can have complete confidence in myself and my team. Can I repeat, I mean, friends and family, of course, will always have a sense of disbelief, but it's easy to eliminate people who are innocent. It's a matter of life and death to find a man who's guilty. So if you've even the slightest hunch, please call. Could I add, the killer himself, according to these psychologists, may be deeply troubled by what he's done. He may not be able to understand it or explain it, but he can put himself in a position where people can help him and make sure he's not the cause of further tragedy. All it takes is a phone call. If you have any information, please call. You can ask to speak to a woman if you prefer, and there are BBC researchers here too. Or you can call the incident room in Wimbledon, that's on 081-947-1212. Please persevere if you find any of these numbers busy. Wimbledon 1 again, 081-947-1212. Well, Crime Watch was off the air during the summer, of course, but throughout that time, police have been working on the information that's been coming in from viewers all over the country. We have news of an arrest just six days ago for the murder of John Shippey. That was the businessman from Rygate. A man has now been charged with his murder and is awaiting trial. And as a result of our last programme in June, there are new leads on several cases, including on two of our reconstructions. We're having to keep mum on both of those for the moment, I'm afraid, but we'll let you know what's going on as soon as we can. And our last photo call generated 100 calls. Details on results in a moment, but first take a look at this month's cases with Superintendent David Hatcher and Detective Constable Jackie Hames. If you've been thinking about buying a timeshare, you may have come across Paul Anthony Kelly. Between 1990 and 1991, he ran two timeshare companies in Gloucester, Holiday Marketing Gloucester Limited and Holiday Marketing Bristol Limited. He's taken a considerable amount of investors' money, in some cases their life savings, claiming he would sell them a timeshare on the Costa del Sol and Gran Canaria. However, he hasn't been seen since July 1991, and Gloucester Police would very much like to speak to him in connection with a substantial fraud. 
He's 37, 5 foot 10, chubby with light brown hair and a Lancashire accent. It's possible he may be in the Bristol area, so if you know where he is now, please ring. On Thursday the 4th of June, a man walked into Oddbins, an off-licence in Putney, south-west London. He asked for a bottle of champagne and brandy. The shop assistant quickly raised the alarm, but the offender ran off. Half an hour later, a man fitting the same description robbed a fast food shop just the other side of Putney Bridge, also using a gun. Do you recognise the man? He's about 25 years old, 5 foot 8, and has a moustache. He was wearing a dark leather bomber jacket and light trousers. If you recognise him, call us now. Strathclyde Police would like to speak to John Burton in connection with a fatal shooting. On Saturday the 11th of April at about 10pm, 21-year-old Jason Kelly was killed. It was outside Richard's Bar in Govan Road, Glasgow. John Burton is 39, between 5 foot 8 and 5 foot 10, with a heavy build. He has greying hair, short at the front and sides, and long at the back. The tip of the ring finger on his right hand is missing. His left hand is scarred, and he has a Glaswegian accent. So if you know where he is, please ring us tonight. Gary Michael Richards may have information about a series of burglaries which have taken place during the past two years. Over 20 of the offences were committed in Aberystwyth, not far from the town centre. Bank cards and cheques which were stolen have since been used to buy train tickets all over the UK. Gary Michael Richards is 34 years old, 5 foot 9 with short hair. If you know where he is now or can help with any of our other photo call faces, please call us. 081 811 8181. That's 081 811 8181. And do please persevere if the lines are busy, which they appear to be already. The last uh, photo call back in June produced immediate results. One man was arrested on the night after a single viewer recognised him. The man has since been charged with a major fraud. Over 50 viewers thought they recognised a woman seen on photo call. Ten gave the same name. The woman is now awaiting a court appearance and 20 calls led to a man who may be able to identify a rapist. Officers from Chesterfield are here tonight investigating an armed raid on a post office van. The whole thing took place in about 15 minutes flat. Some of the details of what happened have been changed for security reasons, and our film actually begins the day before the robbery on Monday the 27th of July in Chesterfield in Derbyshire. Within a stone's throw of the distinctive spire of St Mary's and All Saints Church is Durrant Road Car Park, where late that Monday morning, David Goldthorpe left his Red Rover. By seven o'clock that evening, it had been stolen. The next time anyone remembers seeing that car was the following day in the Whittington Moor area of Chesterfield, about two miles from the town centre. Around 10 in the morning, Tim Oldman was parked in a cul-de-sac at the end of Sheffield Road. His attention was drawn to the two characters who got out of the car. Well, it was the way they were walking. They looked very purposeful. They were looking forward all the time. They didn't look either way. And the clothes they were wearing, because it was a really nice day and they had big green coats on. The person in front seemed to be setting the pace and the person behind looked like he was trying to keep up. All I saw of the driver was when he came back towards me, I just saw a quick glimpse as he went past my car. And he was wearing sunglasses and he started to turn the wheel left. Moments later, a little further up the road, outside the Quick Save supermarket, someone else saw the odd pair. I think what drew my attention was, it was quite a warm day, but both men were wearing anoraks. The first man was a few paces in front of the other. He was about five foot six, with dark hair. The second man was about five foot four, with dark blonde hair, freckles. I suppose I looked at him because of his expression. He um, just looked really terrified. But there was no conversation between them. Just made me feel really uneasy. Meanwhile, a security van was about to make a delivery to Whittington Moor Post Office about a hundred yards further down Sheffield Road. A 
Across the street, Alwyn Jessup was parking his red transit van outside his kitchen centre. seemed very dangerous, very violent, uh, and very loud. I saw the lads go running up the road, and I followed them up in the van till they got to the end of the drive. They ran down the drive, and I thought that they may be going to a vehicle or something like that, if I could get a number. Police believe the robbers had planned their escape route, and that they ran up the drive of a private house, knowing there was a way into a car park on the other side. When Mr. Jessup got to the exit of the car park, a grey or dark-coloured van was coming out. Whoever was driving that van almost certainly saw something significant. Fifteen minutes later, and a mile away in Woodland, close to the old Sheffield Road, the Red Rover was ablaze. A mysterious figure was seen emerging as smoke billowed above the trees. Men working in a transport yard across the road raised the alarm. Something burning. The same man was seen by another witness further up the road. It, it was dressed funny, I'll put it that way. He got a decent suit on, a check cap and dark glasses. And I thought, oh, it's funny, because it was a lovely daylight. And the car nearly knocked him down. The door flew open, the bloke jumped in, laid in front seat, Turn around and away. And remember, that would have been 20 minutes at the most after the robbery took place. Did anyone else see that silver or silvery blue saloon car at about 20 past 10 on the morning of Tuesday, the 28th of July? Detective Sergeant Neil Perry and his colleagues here believe that the two men who carried out the robbery may well have been ducked down in the back seat of the car. And do you recognise the sandy-haired man? We have that good description. He uh, has a pale complexion with freckles and hazel-coloured eyes. He's in his mid-twenties and he's not very tall, about five foot four inches. And did you see that red rover after it was stolen on Monday the 27th of July? In fact, you may have seen it being stolen from the Durrant Road car park. The registration number was J694UBL. If you saw it at any time on Tuesday the 28th, please give us a ring. The officers are waiting now to take your call if you can help on any of that. We're on 081 811 8181 here, or you can ring the rest of the team back at Chesterfield Police Station, and that number is 0246 220100. That's 0246 220100. Could I appeal to you once again to persevere if you find the lines uh, busy? As you can see, they are pretty busy at the moment. A couple here, pretty strong possibilities from photo call, but frankly, most of the calls are coming in on the Rachel Nickel murder. We've got a, a large number of names that have been put forward. One in particular is causing considerable interest to the, the team. We've also, I've just got one here, a woman who was on the common at the time, maybe uh, a possible useful witness. There's calls coming in all the time on this. Now, though, time for this month's incident desk. Here to take us through it are Detective Constable Jackie Haynes and Superintendent David Hatcher. Craig Swan disappeared about six weeks ago, and Scottish police now fear he may be dead. He was staying with his parents in Broxburn near Edinburgh and was last seen on Monday morning the 10th of August. We believe he left the house in his red Datsun car which was seen later that day about 25 miles away in Easter House near Glasgow. A witness remembers seeing a man and a woman parking Craig's car and walk off leaving the keys in the ignition. The man was in his early 30s about 5 foot 7 and walked with a pronounced stoop. The woman was slightly shorter and plump. In the boot of Craig's car were a pair of his shoes, covered in mud. Officers also found this spade and would like to know who it belongs to. Craig was studying for a degree at Southampton University. As part of his studies, he was about to spend a year in Argentina and Brazil. There's no way he'd have vanished of his own free will, so if you have any information, please call us now. A house in Carlisle, Cumbria, was the scene of a robbery on Sunday the 12th of April. Around lunchtime, a man knocked at the door asking to speak to the woman's husband. 
While she was talking to him, he was joined by three other men. They threatened her with a gun and stole cash and jewellery before leaving in a C-registered blue Sierra. It's thought that the registration ended with the letters FGA. The man who knocked on the door is in his late twenties, five foot ten with a soft Scottish accent. Amongst the jewellery they took was a ring and a bracelet, which are unique. Have they been offered to you? If you think you can help in any way, please do ring. In Sheffield at the beginning of July, a man tried to abduct a 16-year-old girl. She was walking along Twentywell Lane in the Bradway area of Sheffield when a man in a red car stopped and asked her for directions. As she stood by the car, he tried to pull her inside, threatening her with a knife. She struggled and managed to fight him off, slightly injuring his face. He was in his late twenties or early thirties, five foot ten and well built. He was wearing glasses which might only be used for driving. His accent was not local. If you've any idea who he might be, Sheffield Police would like to hear from you before someone gets seriously hurt. Call us now if you can help with any of our incident desk cases. And here's the number, 081 811 8181. That's 081 811 8181. Kidnapping is one of the rarest crimes in Britain, perhaps the very simple reason that kidnappers tend to get caught. But one man has eluded capture, that is, until tonight. Cheshire police have helped us reconstruct an abduction that you may have read about last month. We've left out some details which might have encouraged copycat crime. Actors play the parts of the two victims. Punch, Judy. Derek Kerr is manager of Barclays Bank at Sale in Cheshire. He and his wife live 20 miles away at Holmes Chapel. I just saw that there was a, a blue Orion. It was a, a shiny car. Um, and it seemed unusual to be there, but I, I really didn't think any more of it. Went on my, my way home with the dogs. You'd never guess it was called that, would you? Right, 826, thank you. Throw, love. I shouldn't be too late tonight. All right, love, see you later. Right. Does your husband drive a silver grey Volvo estate, age registration? Yes, he does. Well, I'm afraid I've got some bad news for you. He's been involved in a serious accident on the motorway. He's been taken to Leighton Hospital. I've been asked to take you there. Oh. Can you wait there while I go and get my bag? I actually thought he was on his deathbed. I never thought at the time to ask him for any identification. Um, the shock of what he... He said to me, he just made me feel that I had to get to Leighton Hospital as soon as I could. Better put your seatbelt on, Mrs Kerr. It is the law now, you know. Yes, sorry. Did you see a blue Orion with a passenger in the back heading west on the A54 Chester to Buxton Road? In fact, by now, Lizzie's husband was arriving at the bank, as usual. Just after the A54 meets the M6, there's a turn-off called Pulford Lane. What's the matter? Why, why have we stopped? Get out! And he starts to punch me in the face, shouting at me to shut up. And then he tied me up and put me in the boot. And I decided that the only thing I could do was try and listen and try and remember what direction we were travelling in. It also helped concentrate my mind away from the pier. The kidnapper then probably took the M6 northwards to Junction 19 before turning into Pickmere Lane. And then I heard him loading something, which I believe at the time could have been a gun. Um, I thought he was going to shoot me. Hello? 
Good morning, Barclays. Can I help you? Who's calling, please? Derek, it's for you. It's about your wife. Hello, Derek Kerr. I've got your wife, Mr. Kerr. Follow my instructions and she won't get hurt. The call was made at 10.45. The kidnapper may have been at the phone box in Sale Metrolink station. Or perhaps he was in the Great Mills DIY store with line of sight to the back of Barclays Bank. You'll find a note on your car. Where are you? Just do as I say, Mr. Kerr, and hurry. And he gave me a time limit as to when I should follow out his instructions, which was to go to my car, where there would be an envelope waiting for me with further instructions to do what I was told, otherwise my wife would be in severe danger. The letter informed me that I would be responsible for my wife's demise. Um, it contained instructions and it contained a photograph of my wife obviously having been hurt badly. Derek's car was in this tiny car park at the back of the bank. It's next to the big leisure centre car park in Broad Road. Did you see someone leave that note on Derek's windscreen? The letter said that I was to drive my car to the car park behind the branch. All the way through, I just wanted this to go smoothly. My, my only thoughts were for my wife's safety, and I, I wanted him to see me and meet me. Um, he was to make himself known to me. Derek! Derek! He's thrown again. You to head for the M63. Thanks, Wynne. Derek didn't get very far. Heading towards the M63, he turned into Broad Road and then into Old Hall Road. It may seem strange, but I actually felt relief that it was going according to his plan and he'd actually uh, stopped me. Um, and I was then, obviously, going to get the instructions, I thought, as to where my wife was. It was obvious to me that the number plate was a false plate. I could see either string or elastic bands that attached the number plate to its original. He, he waved his arm up and down, his left arm up and down, and I eventually realised that what he wanted me to do was to lie down. Don't look at me. Where's the money? Here. For some reason, the kidnapper took the risk of driving around with Liz Kerr in the boot for a further two hours. It wasn't until one o'clock that he dropped her off at Bertles Lane in Over Alderley, about ten miles from her home. I'd just like him to be caught, really, because if he does it again, the next person might not be so lucky. He had no qualms about punching me then. He probably would have gone further if he had to. This is the culprit, or something like him, and he's pretty distinctive because he's tall, probably over six foot three. His hair is ginger or reddish. He has freckles and blue eyes. Everyone describes him as well-spoken, and he's in his 30s. David Holt, uh, possibly he's got some sort of military background as well. You also think it's possible that um, he was involved in something a week before this? Yes, the Friday before this, on the 7th of August, there was an incident in Solihull in the West Midlands, almost identical, but no kidnap on that occasion and no ransom paid. Another ransom note, though. We can compare. One was uh, done on a typewriter, one was done on a, a word processor. Now, obviously, these are, these are fairly commonplace typefaces and fonts. You want somebody who can, can link them with a man of that description? Exactly that, yes. 
Okay, the other thing is these plates, J763BYG. Now, he didn't make those up. No, they're very professionally made. Someone must, have, must remember making those up, and we would urge them to get in touch with us too. The uniform he was wearing when he, when he came to the door, was that a real police uniform, do you know? Very much like a real police uniform or a security officer's uniform. A big man, someone must remember hiring that out or lending it to that man. Or having a six or foot three it. or above uniform like that, or having these. Now, this is uh, not a laundry as much as a dry cleaning ticket. This is Monday, 12 noon. It's for, for looks like, grey trousers, G trousers, on the 8th of August, £4.75. Who does that belong to? Where did it come from? They were dropped off at Sketchless Cleaners in Cardiff on the Saturday. The following Tuesday, the 11th, they were collected. Those tickets were found in the gateway where Mrs Kerr was abandoned. We desperately need to know who that person is. He left the name Evans at Sketchless. How did these make their way from South Wales to Cheshire? If they were yours, for heaven's sake, ring us and eliminate them, because if they can't be eliminated, there's going to be a lot of police work wasted unless they actually do belong to the kidnappers. Let me just say, Barclays Bank have offered a very, very large reward indeed, up to £50,000. As I say, something uh, kidnapping is something that uh, people tend not to get away with in this country. And incidentally, in any case, half the money he has is traceable. Here are all the numbers. We haven't got time to go through them now means though he can't even spend it so do call us and let's try and catch him 081 811 081-811-8181 or you can call Cheshire Police Headquarters and 0244 313131 that's 0244 the code for Chester 313131 our last reconstruction tonight is the murder of 18 year old Kate Ratcliffe she'd been out dancing with friends at a popular club in Camberley in Surrey at the end of the evening, through a misunderstanding which turned out to be tragic, Kate's friends left for home without her. A few hours later, Kate was dead. Now, why was she killed and by whom? Was it by some stranger who saw her by chance out walking in the small hours? Or perhaps had somebody followed her from the club? Police badly need your help. Our reconstruction begins at the hairdressing salon where Kate was a trainee. Kate had worked at Bumbles 2 for nearly two years. No, I go on Saturday, actually. Should be quite fun. I'm going to Batman's. Uh, Alison Glover, who runs the salon, remembers Kate with great affection. Kate came to the salon two years ago, straight out of school. She was always very friendly and willing to help and do anything that she could possibly do. She had a great enthusiasm for the job. She was happy, happy-go-lucky, everyday teenager. Kate lived two miles away in Hawley with her parents and older sister, Joanne. Kate was my only sister. She loved going out, she loved dancing, she had a lot of friends, she loved her job. She was just a normal 18-year-old, happy-go-lucky girl. Where's my jacket? Is it ready? Which one? My blue one. Oh, it's in there. There you go. Got it. Kate and her best friend Michelle always went out on a Saturday night. Hmm. Gotta change this music. Well, not now. I've only just put it on. Oh, we've listened to loads of yours. Anyway, this is better. Kate and Michelle often went to Ragamuffins in Camberley. It's a popular nightclub in an indoor shopping precinct. This Saturday, they arrived there shortly before nine o'clock. They'd arranged to meet some other friends there. Thanks, Scott. I want to go and dance, though. Come on, Michelle, come and dance. Ooh. Come on. There's hardly anyone down there. Don't worry about it. Come on, come dance. <laughs> Several people at the club noticed a man in his mid-twenties standing alone at one end of the dance floor. He was dressed entirely in black and he stood staring silently at the dancers throughout the night. Who was he? During the evening, Kate met a former boyfriend, Metin. They'd ended their relationship some six months ago, but Kate was still very fond of him. Oh, mine. He's just on the top there somewhere. Is he still with Dom? Yeah, it's a boy's night out, isn't it? But... Can I work with you? Yeah, 
As closing time approached, the lone man was still standing in the same place. There were 516 people at Ragamuffins that night. Police have spoken to all except 33 of them. If one of those is you, we need to hear from you. No one saw Kate leave the club. She probably went when the music finished around 2 o'clock. Assuming she'd left with Metin, her friends didn't worry about her. In fact, he'd left before her. Police believe she went outside searching for him. A few streets away from the club, a witness was waiting up for his son. The van was a blue transit board van. He had short cropped brown hair, was aged between 20, 20 and 24 and had a moustache. He was clearly lost. Back at the precinct, Kate had returned to Ragamuffins. She seemed to be looking for someone. She was clearly upset. Someone's sitting in front of the uh, nightclub door. Kevin, could you get a move for us, please? Could you uh, also inform the young lady that it's 2.30 and we've got to lock the doors as well? As soon as I saw her, I realised it was the young lady that you were talking about on the radio. I was waiting to lock up, and she was one of the last to leave. I asked her to use the automatic doors, but she walked straight past, and I had to unlock the door to let her out. You got a cigarette, please? Yeah. Thanks. I saw her walk two or three yards outside the doors and stop. She just stood there, and after I locked up, I remember logging down the time. It was 2.30. It's always busy outside the precinct as ragamuffins turns out, but within half an hour or so, the area is almost deserted. One of the few people still around was an acquaintance of Kate's, Philip Williams. I could see Kate was on her own, and she was obviously upset. I kept asking her how she was. She didn't reply. I got the impression she was looking for a friend met him. An hour after that, and four miles away, another witness saw a blue transit van. Roxanne Jameson was on her way home. I remember leaving work early in the hours of Sunday. It was about half past two when I left, and I got to Farnborough at about quarter past three. I drove down the Union Street um, to the Prospect Road Junction, where the traffic lights were red, so I had to wait. A blue transit van came hurtling around the corner from underneath the bridge. I did try to look for the driver, but I didn't see the driver or the registration plates. Just 200 yards away from that junction, at 8 o'clock that Sunday morning, Kate's body was found. She'd been fatally stabbed. I can't begin to understand why anybody would want to hurt Kate. She, she didn't have any enemies. She was a very popular girl. Um, I miss her. We all miss her a great deal. Um, if there is anybody out there that can, can help, please just come forward. Well, from Hampshire Police, Mr. Bugard is here to take the calls. How, first of all, do you think that Kate got from Camberley to Farnborough, four or five miles away? Well, it had to be by transport of some sort, a car or a van. Uh, and we're still very interested in any sightings of her, either talking to a driver of such a vehicle or getting into a vehicle. Mm. And how important do you think those two sightings of a blue transit van are? Quite an old van. They, they, could, be they could be important. I mean, they're in different areas they've been seen. Um, but um, the one in Park Row, we do have this photo fit of this man, which uh, does help us um, ask the person who was driving that to come forward. Um, the other one, by the very nature of the driving, they would probably recognise them as the driver. And you had a recent sighting, a third sighting of a blue transit van in the right area at the right time? Yes, we did. In the, in the recent days, in the taxi rank outside of Camberley Railway Station, um, could well be uh, a similar vehicle. So more and blue transit vans would be useful. Right. You're offering complete confidentiality on the, to re the remaining 33 people at the club that night. One detail we didn't mention in the film is that the lone man standing at one end of the hall had very distinctive boots on. Yes, black crocodile boots with silver toe caps. I would have thought that would ring a distinctive bell with certainly with the individual and possibly with other customers. Mm. And just to remind you, the date is the early hours of Saturday the 6th of June and Sunday the 7th of June, so if that was you, please do ring us tonight. Finally, the jacket that Kate wore that night has disappeared. This is one very similar. This is a similar jacket. Uh, the only thing to recognise is that the bottom button on the left-hand side is, was missing off her jacket. 
If you notice anyone you know behaving strangely after the 6th of June, if you have any information at all that can help Dennis Bogard and his colleagues, 081-811-8181 is the number here in the studio. Or you can phone the incident room in Aldershot, and that's 0252 24545. That's 0252, the code for Aldershot, 24545. A tremendous number of calls. Can I just say on uh, photo call, uh, Paul Anthony Kelly, we've had so many callers saying where they think he is that we are uh, fairly confident that we're going to get something on there. We'll give you some more of this in just a moment. Now, though, to uh, Aladdin's Cave, a treasure trove of property recovered by police. Here to take us through it is Eric Knowles. Thank you, Nick. Well, I've been in the antique business for about 20 years or more, and I've seen an awful lot of Chinese Canton porcelain, but this is the first. I've never seen a Canton mantle clock case before. Probably dates from the mid to the late 19th century. It's quite typical with these hand-painted scenes of mandarins and attendants upon a terrace. But come and have a look at this selection of enamel boxes. In fact, this one's rather special. It's not enamel, it's porcelain. It's Meissen. It dates from around about 1735, 1740. And it, the decoration is magnificent, very finely executed, and it's got wonderful um, Augsburg silver mounts. Now, the decoration is on every facet of that box, and even on the interior of the lid is a very interesting scene. Obviously, if you own it and recognize it, you'll know what that scene is. Calais and Dover, a pair of oils here by that man, George Webster. Wonderful marine artist. We don't know an awful lot about, about him from a biographical point of view, but he seems to have been working around about 1790 to about 1830. And I love his work. He always manages to put a sense of drama into his seascapes. I, I really feel for the men in the longboat there who are hauling in the the anchor in what is a very choppy sea. But moving into the 20th century, and here's an artist, Anna Zinkheisen. Here's a picture that's entitled The Life Force. Now, I'm not quite sure what it's all about, but maybe that's the bridge of life. It's full of symbolism. It's not typical of Anna Zinkheisen's work, but it's a fine picture. Now, here's a teapot, and I'm keeping lots of fingers crossed about this one. When I saw it initially, I thought, straightforward leads, it's very light, typical enamel decoration. But it says on here, Samuel Abbott and Margaret Bowman, Whitehaven, 1770. Now, it just so happens that a factory has been discovered, a creamware factory has recently been discovered in Whitehaven, just the shards. And I'm keeping everything crossed that this is not Leeds, but it's Whitehaven. If it is, it's a very, very important teapot. So important that I brought along the long arm of the law just to keep an eye. A policeman from about 1880, doing his bit. 081 811 8181. 081 for Outer London, 811 8181. Or you can phone Gloucestershire Police direct on 0242 222 848. That's 0242, the code for Cheltenham, 222 848. Just tell you a little bit more about the calls that are coming in, and they're really coming in very hard and fast tonight. Katie Ratcliffe, I haven't spoken to the investigating officer myself, but I gather that the team is really quite excited about one name that they've been given on that. As far as the Rachel Nickell murder is concerned, 90 calls here to the studio the last time I spoke to the team. Ten of them, Superintendent Bassett says, a very interesting one man has gone straight to the top of their priority list. More calls coming in all the time. The lines are open till midnight, though. Sue? They are indeed, and we'll have more news, and let's hope some important developments in just over an hour's time. That'll be Crime Watch update right after question time. And for the next three weeks, you can see more of what goes on behind the scenes and how viewers' information has helped to solve some of our most serious crimes. Crime Watch file starts next Thursday night at 9.30, immediately after the news. Tonight, though, do join us for Crime Watch update, but if you can't stay up till then, do keep in mind that what we've shown tonight uh, should be kept in proportion. It's true, of course, that crime does more than anything to undermine civil liberties in Britain. But the fact that crime still makes such headlines means that the worst offences, the ones we're working on tonight, are still unusual. And with all the calls that are coming in right now, it looks like even these are on the way to being solved. So don't have nightmares. Do sleep well. Good night. Good night.
Well, welcome back. And the main news is that we've had a really overwhelming response on the Rachel Nickell appeal. There seems to be one lead which sounds particularly encouraging. More on that later, I hope. Photocall has yielded some interesting calls. We may be near an arrest soon. And Eric Knowles is excited as we may be close to finding the owner of that unique Whitehaven teapot. Let's start with the uh, violent kidnapping of a woman in Cheshire. On Friday the 14th of August, soon after her husband had driven off to work, Liz Kerr was abducted from her Mrs. home. Kerr. Yes? Does your husband drive a silver grey Volvo estate? H registration? Yes, he does. Well, I'm afraid I've got some bad news for you. That was not a real police officer. Poor Mrs Kerr was uh, hit fairly hard in the face and uh, abducted. What sort of response have you had? Overwhelming response, both here and in Cheshire. Significantly, a number of names are coming up more than once, and we've had a good response and good suggestions both in Cardiff and in the Greater Manchester and Cheshire. Now, area. the Cardiff connection was very interesting because you've got some dry cleaning slips which you discovered where um, Liz was eventually released. Now, you've got some calls from Cardiff you're particularly interested in. Yes, we have, but we haven't yet heard from Mr Evans or the person who gave the name Evans and the person that put those trousers in. I'm very interested in hearing from him. That man who is very distinctive, he's six foot three, he's got ginger hair, and he might well have a blue Orion car, certainly had access to it uh, at the time of the Cardiff. Uh, at the time of the kidnap, and a lot of suggestions he might have for some military background. Yes, the, there's been a lot of suggestions on military background. Okay, yes. Mr. Hull, thank you very much. Well, we've had so many calls on the Rachel Nickell case that view, as viewers on other cases yeah. may have found it difficult to get through. Right. But, David, what have we had on incident desk so far? Well, just a very few calls, Sue, because it looks as though that's exactly what's happened. If you have been trying to get through on incident desk cases, please ring your local police station after the programme closes down. They'll be pleased to take the information you have. But one case that we have got a, what looks like a very good lead on is on the final case we dealt with, the attempted abduction of the 16-year-old girl from Sheffield. A PC's called in who's dealt with a man who he reckons fits the video fit of our offender. He's got a similar car and we're following that one up now. That's good news, David. Thank you. Aladdin's cave this month was assembled by uh, Gloucestershire police and a, a lot of this they think is stolen. What's been the response, Eric? Well, I'd like to stress that this is the tip of the iceberg. There's 4,000 objects in this hall. Um, the response in the box is good. Um, that nice little mice and box. I've yet to be told what's in the interior of the lid. Uh, again, objects in the background grabbing attention. This water carrier. I'd like to stress to a lady Nisha, she's not bronze, she's pottery. Okay. But um, the exciting news is the teapot. Um, um, the, let me just say that they're dancing on the tables in Whitehaven at the moment. I've been in touch with somebody up there. They think it could be one of the missing links. Uh, I've actually had a lady from Yorkshire who gave me some wonderful information. It passed through a sale in London in 1967. She could give me the lot number. Uh, and she thinks it went to America, which the police tell me makes sense. <laughs> OK, looks like a tatty old teapot to me. Perhaps the most valuable thing we've ever had on Crime Watch. So. Right. Well, next, the murder of 18-year-old Kate Ratcliffe. Kate was last seen after she spent the evening of Saturday, the 6th of June, dancing at Ragamuffin Club in a shopping centre in Camberley in Surrey. Kate was last seen at about half past two in the morning outside the shopping precinct. Believing she'd already left with someone else, her friends had gone home without her. Five hours later, Kate was found dead. She'd been stabbed. And Detective Superintendent Bogard has been taking the call. Very encouraging at the moment in total between the incident room at order shop and here probably about 140 calls we've had on this mainly about the uh, the man in the van and uh, possible nominations for the van and also the uh, uh, the man in the club we can quick have, have a look at the uh, man in the van now yes this is this man in his early 20s uh, with this um, moustache and this very uh, cropped um, hair what you still need um, calls on is the, the more people at the club including the lone man Yes, I mean, we've had a, a, quite a number on those, but uh, let's have some more. And Kate getting into a vehicle between 2.30 and 8. At the moment, we've not had any calls on that, and that's what I'm primarily interested in. And it's Saturday the 6th of June, or the small hours of Sunday 7th of June. That's right. Anything you'd like to add? I'd just like to say that if there is anyone out there who's got that crucial information about an individual they know, please give us a ring. Thank you. Photo call now. Let's see if it's uh, as successful as the last programme. What's been happening tonight, Jackie? Well, it seems we've been a bit overwhelmed by the calls for the reconstructions, but uh, it's only so far. Perhaps the night is ya yet young. One very good uh, response, you yeah. think, though. Paul Anthony Kelly, the man involved in timeshare marketing, um, we've had over 20 calls citing him, so that looks a real possibility. Perhaps the that's the exception. The odd bins robber? Um, a very good uh, film of him, but five names suggested, none of them too exciting. And extraordinarily wonderful pictures of the other two, and there are virtually no responses on, on either of them. No, if you know who they are, please ring us. We do need to know where they are now. Okay, so thank you.
Well, now the robbery in Chesterfield on the 28th of July. We asked if you recognised two quite distinctive-looking characters who were seen by several witnesses in the Whittington Moor area of the city shortly before a security van made a routine delivery to the post office there. Well, the robbery was over in a matter of seconds. Did you see the men make their getaway up a private driveway to a car park? You've had quite a few calls, I believe, Neil Parry. That's correct, yes. The response from the public has been very good. We now believe we've eliminated the blue van that left the rear of, the, the rear of Paul Air's carpets on Whittington Moor. That is important. The, the, the man who was driving that van has right, now contacted yes. us. Unfortunately, you didn't see anything significant? No, we didn't, unfortunately. Secondly, we've been given several names as to the identity of the fair-haired suspect, which we'll be pursuing upon our return to Chesterfield. Can we just have his uh, description again? The description is, is small, which is five foot four inch tall, slim build, pale complexion, hazel eyes, straight sandy hair and freckles. If you can help us, the lines are still open. Please call. Finally, the murder of Rachel Nickell, the young mother stabbed to death while strolling with her little son on Wimbledon Common in south-west London. We've left this to laugh, frankly, because we've had so many calls to, to process. Mr Bassett, how many? Do you know? Well, we've had over 300 calls. Uh, it, it's been a tremendous result. Uh, both at uh, this studio and our police station at Wilbur. And actually, interesting, although we're expecting a lot of anonymous calls, almost everybody's given their name and a lot of people have given a lot of details. Yes, and that's most encouraging. I said earlier in the main programme, one man's name had gone right at the top of your priority list. What can, without giving too much away, what can you tell us about that? Well, uh, we've had uh, a number of calls identifying one man. Um, I mustn't get too over enthusiastic because of course uh, he could be a social misfit that they're trying to get uh, rid of off their estate but it does look very very encouraging at the moment and there's somebody else who you're very interested to is sort of number two priority now yes there, there is another man that's been named more than once and uh, we're very encouraged by that as well i should say in both these cases there are a number of things that really link them not only to the area but to some other specific things as well so they are quite intriguing and you've got some other witnesses who've come forward again other people who were on wimbledon common that yeah, morning yes it's incredible to think that we've been running eight weeks but still people are getting in touch with us and saying that we were on the common on that day right the man himself there was a faint possibility the clinical psychologist said might ring him himself yes. he has not done so he has not okay thank you so well heartfelt thanks to everyone who's called so far that is it for this month don't forget our lines are staying open until midnight you'll see a list of local numbers in a moment on the screen and you can call those at any time of course we'll be back here a month from now but in the meantime you can find out exactly how viewers calls can help police solve some of our most serious crimes that'll be on crime watch file every thursday for the next three weeks at half past nine immediately after the news they show how effective these are the sort of calls that are coming behind us right now and it looks like several of these cases now really are on the way to being solved so don't have nightmares do sleep well good night good night